Pope Pius XI said, The Catholic Church alone is keeping the true worship. This is the font of truth. This is the house of faith. This is the temple of God. Pope Benedict XV said, Such is the nature of the Catholic faith that it does not admit of more or less, but must be held as a wall, or as a wall reject. This is the Catholic faith, which unless a man believe faithfully and firmly, he cannot be saved. Pope Paul VI said, Homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered and can in no case be approved of. This is no longer your grandparents' Catholic Church. And yet it is supposed to be the one outside of which no one can be saved. Whether the Pope is calling for a crusade or kissing the Quran, whether he is burning Protestants or praying with Muslims in a mosque, most Roman Catholics insist theirs is the Church established by Jesus Christ. Yet we have a warning from Jesus himself. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up, and hath shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without, and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are, then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. Are you striving to enter by the straight gate? Does truth really matter to you? It definitely matters to God. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Simply calling yourself something doesn't make it true. So how do you know you'll go to the day of judgment as a Christian and not as one of those that Jesus describes as self-deceived? Is your confidence in being a member of the Roman Catholic Church? How do you know that heaven is really awaiting you rather than hell? Rome claims its faith is historic and Catholic supported by the unanimous consent of the Fathers. But is this really true? Cardinal Newman famously said, To be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. Yet over a thousand years before the Protestant Reformation, Athanasius, the Bishop of Alexandria, rejected the judgments of both the Roman Pope and Church Councils. Like the Protestant Reformers who followed his example, he stood on the authority of God's Word in the Bible and defended the Christian faith against its enemies. Ironically, Athanasius is not considered a heretic or schismatic by Rome today. He has been declared a saint and is the earliest of the doctors recognized by the Roman Church. To understand what transpired, we need to go back to the events that led up to the Council of Nicaea. Even during the days of the Apostles, there were people who claimed to be Christians, yet rejected the very heart of the Gospel, that the Creator had truly suffered in the place of the creature. To accept that such a great sacrifice was needed would mean that God is far holier and our sins are far worse than they wanted to imagine. For God to have even taken own human flesh was a scandal to the Greek mind. Their ideal was to escape the body and to become pure spirit. In the same way the crowds in Athens had rejected the Apostle Paul's teaching of a physical resurrection, they also rejected the idea of an incarnation. Just as many in our day compromise biblical truth trying to make Christianity popular. The same was true then. Some taught that Jesus was truly God, but he was not truly man. He only appeared to be a man, 
and he only appeared to suffer on the cross. The Greek word for appear is decane, so this group is known to history as the Docetists. Despite their claims of being Christians, God said through the Apostle John, Many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So the apostolic witness was clear. The Docetists were no Christians at all, but antichrist. Theirs was a false gospel with a false Jesus. It's not that salvation is simply a matter of a theological checklist. But they were rejecting the explicit testimony of the apostles and the true sacrificial work of Jesus on the cross. They may have been religious, but they refused to hear the Holy Spirit speaking through the apostles. This demonstrated they had never truly been born again. Docetism was condemned, yet the underlying temptation to make the gospel pleasing to the world remained. There were many who tried to redefine the faith to keep God off the cross. Some began to teach that though Jesus was truly a man, he wasn't truly God. He was merely a man adopted by God. When this was rejected by church councils, some began to teach that Jesus was somewhat divine, but not in the same sense as the Father. This is what led to the Council of Nicaea in the year 325. Arius was a presbyter in Alexandria. He had publicly challenged a sermon by Bishop Alexander that stressed the similarity of Jesus and the Father. Though Arius referred to Jesus as God, he argued that Jesus was not of the same essence or substance as the Father. Essentially, Arius was arguing that Jesus was a sort of demigod. Alexander called a church council that denounced Arius' teachings and removed him from office. Despite this, Arius had his supporters, Bishop Eusebius of Nicomedia and others, denounced what Alexander had done. Christianity had been legal throughout the Roman Empire for a dozen years, but it was only in the previous year that Constantine had finally defeated Licinius in the East and become the sole ruler of the Roman Empire. After long years of civil war, Constantine would not ignore such divisions in the church, so he called the Council of Nicaea to resolve the issue. The council considered their arguments, and 316 out of 318 bishops reaffirmed the biblical teaching that Jesus is by nature equal with the Father and of the same essence or substance. Arianism was denounced as a counterfeit gospel. Many would have you believe that Nicene Orthodoxy then triumphed because of the support of the emperor. The reality is very different. Constantine was a politician who simply wanted these controversies ended. He initially exiled Arius and his supporters, but when they reworded their teachings, Constantine soon allowed them to return and take up offices in the church again. He saw those who resisted as troublemakers and rebels. In the interim, Bishop Alexander had died and Athanasius had been declared the new bishop of Alexandria. Athanasius recognized that Arianism was nothing less than a denial of the biblical gospel, because it was not really God who suffered on the cross. When Athanasius tried to protect the church from the Arian heresy, Constantine ordered him to attend the Synod of Tyre in 335. There, he was condemned by Arian bishops and soon after exiled by Constantine under threat of death. Two years later, the Arians found even greater support in Constantine's successor Constantius and eventually took control over the whole church. They called more church councils that rejected the Nicene Creed and exiled any bishops that opposed them. Another doctor of the church, St. Jerome, described it. The Nicene faith stood condemned by acclamation. The whole world groaned and was astonished to find itself Arian. Among those exiled was the Bishop of Rome, Pope Liberius. Though he held firm for a time, Liberius would ultimately surrender to the Arians and excommunicate Athanasius as the price of returning to Rome. This was to denounce Athanasius as no Christian at all and worthy of everlasting hell. Based on statements by Pope Pius IX in 1873, some Roman Catholics deny that Liberius actually condemned Athanasius. In order to do so, they have to claim that the writings of St. Hilary were somehow altered in the Middle Ages to include three counterfeit letters 
in which Liberius admits to the excommunication. An anathema by Hilary against Liberius is also said to have been misattributed. They have to claim church historians Socrates and Rufinus, who both lived in the 4th century, were misinformed or simply lying. They also claim that 5th century historian Sozomen was misled when he claimed that Liberius not only excommunicated Athanasius, but anathematized the language of the Nicene Creed. Though most Roman Catholic historians reject such conspiracy theories, they still insist the Pope is infallible. They argue that Liberius suffered during his exile and was not responsible for what he did. They also claim that anathemas and excommunications are not really related to faith and morals, even though they remove someone from the Catholic Church, outside of which there is supposedly no salvation. St. Jerome, who lived through these events, describes the situation very differently. Liberius was ordained as the 34th bishop of the Roman Church, and when he had been thrust into exile on account of the faith, all the clerics swore they would receive no other in his place. But when Felix had been substituted in his priestly office by the Arians, very many of them broke their oath. And a year later, they were expelled with Felix because Liberius, being overcome by the weariness of exile, had subscribed to heretical perversity and entered Rome as a victor. Despite all the confusion modern defenders of Rome try to create, the church fathers are very clear that Athanasius found himself condemned by church councils and excommunicated by Pope Liberius. To a great extent, he stood contra mundum, against the world, in defending the full deity of Christ, even against the Pope. According to Pope Pius IX, to oppose the Pope is to remove oneself from the possibility of salvation. This Catholic dogma is equally well known, that one cannot be saved outside the Catholic Church, and that those who knowingly rebel against the teaching and authority of the Church cannot obtain eternal salvation, nor can those who willfully separate themselves from union with the Church and with the Roman Pontiff, the successor of Peter, the womb the Savior has entrusted the safekeeping of his vineyard. This was echoed at the First Vatican Council. If then, any should deny that it is by the institution of Christ the Lord and by divine right that blessed Peter should have a perpetual line of successors in the primacy over the universal church, or that the Roman pontiff is not the successor of blessed Peter in this primacy, let him be anathema. By these later standards, Athanasius should have submitted himself to Pope Liberius in the councils. To refuse would be to lose any hope of heaven. And yet Athanasius did refuse. Off and on for much of 31 years he suffered exile. Yet he held firm, because he knew that to be Catholic and apostolic had more to do with holding to the faith of the apostles than possession of an outward office. Athanasius stood against the Pope and church councils based on the clear teaching of the Bible. Our faith is right and starts from the teaching of the apostles and tradition of the fathers, being confirmed both by the New Testament and the Old. Vainly, then, do they run about with the pretext that they have demanded counsels for the faith's sake. For divine scripture is sufficient above all things. But if a counsel be needed on the point, there are the proceedings of the fathers, for the Nicene bishops did not neglect this matter, but stated the doctrine so exactly that persons reading their words honestly cannot but be reminded by them of the religion towards Christ announced in divine scripture. Athanasius was not rejecting all councils and bishops, but he recognized that they contradicted one another. He was not rejecting tradition either, but he recognized it was a mixture of truth and error. Only the Bible was God-breathed and the standard by which even councils and bishops could be judged. Athanasius and the true Catholic faith eventually triumphed, and even Rome embraced the faith they had denied. Today, Athanasius is heralded as the father of orthodoxy and a doctor of the Roman Catholic Church. When Rome speaks of a unanimous consent of the fathers, they gloss over the fact that Pope Liberius excommunicated Athanasius and never retracted it. They make all manner of excuses for Liberius, 
because without a unanimous consent of the fathers, their claims to authority collapse. The Second Vatican Council declared, Sacred tradition and sacred scripture form one sacred deposit of the Word of God committed to the Church. The task of authentically interpreting the Word of God, whether written or handed on, has been entrusted exclusively to the living teaching office of the Church. It's difficult for Rome to claim that sacred tradition has been authentically maintained and the scriptures authentically interpreted when St. Jerome insists that Pope Liberius subscribed to heretical perversity and when the man Liberius condemned has been declared a doctor of the church. The reality is that when there is consent among the early church fathers, it is often to positions later anathematized by Rome. Not only did Athanasius put Scripture over the Pope and councils, but he also rejected the canonicity of the Apocrypha. So not only did the First Vatican Council anathematize his views on the papacy, but also his views on the canon as well. If anyone shall not receive as sacred and canonical the books of Holy Scripture, entire with all their parts, as the Holy Synod of Trent has enumerated them, or shall deny that they have been divinely inspired, let him be anathema. In his 39th festal letter, Athanasius explicitly rejected the canonicity of the Apocrypha. He was not alone. St. Jerome summarizes the view he and Athanasius shared with other declared doctors of the Roman Church, St. Gregory Nazianzen, St. Basil, and St. Hilary. This prologue I write as a preface to the books to be translated by us from the Hebrew into Latin, that we may know that all the books which are not of this number are apocryphal. Therefore, wisdom, which is commonly ascribed to Solomon as its author, and the book of Jesus, the son of Sirach, Judith, Tobit, and the shepherd are not in the canon. Besides his views on papal infallibility in the canon, Athanasius also taught views of the Eucharist that were later anathematized by the Council of Trent. If anyone says that in the sacred and holy sacrament of the Eucharist the substance of the bread and wine remains conjointly with the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and denies that wonderful and singular change of the whole substance of the bread into the body and the whole substance of the wine into the blood, the appearance is only of bread and wine remaining, which change the Catholic Church most aptly calls transubstantiation, let him be anathema. In describing the sacrament, Athanasius, as John Calvin would a thousand years later, described our truly partaking of the body and blood of Christ, but not in anything resembling transubstantiation. Rather, it was a spiritual feeding, by faith. Speaking of Christ, Athanasius said, He distinguished the spirit from what is of the flesh, in order that they might believe not only in what was visible in him, but in what was invisible, and so understand that what he says is not fleshly, but spiritual. For how many would the body suffice as food for it to become meat even for the whole world? But this is why he mentioned the ascending of the Son of Man into heaven, namely, to draw them off from their corporeal idea, and that from thenceforth they might understand that the aforesaid flesh was heavenly from above, and spiritual meat to be given at his hands. For what I have said unto you, says he, is spirit and life, as much as to say what is manifested and to be given for the salvation of the world is the flesh which I wear. But this, and the blood from it, shall be given to you spiritually at my hands, as meat, so as to be imparted spiritually in each one, and to become for all a preservative to resurrection of life eternal. To be truly deep in history is to recognize that the consent of the fathers is neither unanimous nor in support of what Rome teaches today. The Protestant Reformation was not about some new and novel reading of the Bible. As with Athanasius, it was about defending the biblical and historically Catholic faith against the Bishop of Rome. 
Though the Reformers saw the Scriptures alone as God breathed, they took great comfort that they were reading them in much the same way as the Church Fathers had before them. The printing press that had made the Bible more readily available also made the writings of the Church Fathers more readily available. To a great extent, the Reformation in Zurich began with Ulrich Zwingli reading the commentaries of John Chrysostom, written over a thousand years earlier. In 1536, at the Colloquy of Lausanne, the Protestants were accused of ignoring the Church Fathers. Snippets of the Fathers' writings were offered in support of Rome, as quoted in Peter Lombard's sentences. John Calvin responded by quoting the Fathers in context to demonstrate that they were often being misquoted or were contradicted by other Fathers. Calvin said, Those who make parade of according them great reverence often do not hold them in such great honor as we, nor do they deign to occupy the time reading their writings as we willingly do. Despite Catholic claims that Protestants ignored the tradition of the Church Fathers, Calvin quoted from them over 800 times in his final edition of the Institutes of the Christian Religion. The call of the Protestant Reformation was to go back to the true Catholic faith, the faith anathematized by Rome, but confirmed by the Scriptures and many of the Church Fathers. Rome refused to hear that call, but moved even further from the Catholic faith. At the Council of Trent, they anathematized the Gospel as it was taught by the Reformers, even though that meant anathematizing how it had been taught by St. Augustine and much of the early Church. Instead of focusing on Jesus, Rome has put more and more emphasis on Mary. Instead of going back to the Scriptures and the Church Fathers, they declared the Pope their infallible authority at the First Vatican Council in 1870. To many who call themselves Protestants and Catholics today, these arguments from the past seem pointless. Though the Bible says otherwise, they believe that it has become an established fact that few, if any, people are actually going to hell. Liberal Protestants have no authority outside of their own feelings to come to such conclusions. But since the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, Rome has had popes teaching that even non-Christians go to heaven. Gone are the days of Latin masses and burning heretics. Instead, Muslims, Hindus, and even atheists are supposedly going to heaven. So most Catholics assume they'll be just fine. It sounds comforting. But can you really trust a pope who not only contradicts the Protestant reformers, but also previous popes? What if the pope isn't really Catholic? The Catholic Church used to be very clear that apart from submission to the Pope, everyone went to hell. Pope Boniface VIII said, We declare, we proclaim, we define that it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman Pontiff. Though Rome's message has become more congenial since the Second Vatican Council, the Pope still claims to be the Vicar of Christ, the infallible head of the Christian Church. As we will see, supposedly infallible popes have contradicted one another on the very definition of the Catholic faith. Popes have even denounced previous popes as heretics. But before we go there, let's look at Rome's claims to being the one true Church. Those claims are based on Rome's understanding of the 16th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock 
I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Rome argues that Jesus was here establishing Peter as the head of his church. It claims that headship was to be enjoyed infallibly by Peter's successors as the bishop of a church that did not even yet exist, over 2,000 miles away. The First Vatican Council in 1870 insisted this was the ancient and constant faith of universal church. Such claims do not hold up to scrutiny. St. John Chrysostom, a bishop recognized by Rome as a doctor of the church, commented on this passage. Upon this rock, he did not say upon Peter, for it is not upon the man, but upon his own faith that the church is built. And what is this faith? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Similarly, another doctor of the church, St. Augustine, said, For Petra is not derived from Peter, but Peter from Petra, just as Christ is not called so from the Christian, but the Christian from Christ. For on this very account the Lord said, On this rock will I build my church. Because Peter had said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. On this rock, therefore, he said, which thou hast confessed, I will build my church. For the rock was Christ, and on this foundation was Peter himself built. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. The majority of the early church fathers who commented on this passage saw Jesus, or the profession of faith that Peter had made about Jesus to be the rock. Even if they identified Peter as the rock, he was typically seen as symbolic for all believers, but not as the first pope. Nine chapters earlier in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus had described the one who heard his words and kept them as the one who built on the rock. Are we to believe that Jesus is now making Peter the rock on which he will build his church? Consider the more immediate context of Matthew 16. It begins with Jesus asking the disciples who men say that he is and ends with Jesus charging them to tell no one that he is the Christ. The focus is Jesus, not Peter. Peter himself makes clear that Jesus is the rock on which the church is built. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. The biblical foundation of the church is not a single pope, but all the apostles. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. When Peter addressed the elders of the church, he did not address them as a pope, but as a fellow elder. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof not by constraint but willingly, not for filthy lucre but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage but being ensamples to the flock. Papal claims of authority rest not only on Peter individually being the rock, but on him alone being given the keys with which to bind and loose. Yet two chapters later in Matthew's Gospel, we see that power given to all the disciples. Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth 
shall be loosed in heaven. Rome claims the papacy rests on the ancient and constant faith of the universal church, but the idea of a universal bishop cannot be found in the writings of anyone outside of Rome for the first five centuries of the church. One of the reasons that Athanasius did not submit to Liberius was because he was also called Popham or Pope as the bishop of Alexandria. This was nothing new. A century earlier, even the Roman clergy had addressed St. Cyprian, the bishop of Carthage, as Popham. Cyprian wrote, Certainly the other apostles also were what Peter was, endued with an equal fellowship both of honor and power. When Pope Stephen I opposed his discipline in the North African church, Cyprian called a council of 87 bishops. They told Pope Stephen, No one setteth himself up as a bishop of bishops, or by tyrannical terror forceth his colleagues to a necessity of obeying, inasmuch as every bishop, in the free use of his liberty and power, has the right of forming his own judgment, and can no more be judged by another than he can himself judge another. The early church honored the bishop of Rome when he echoed the faith of Peter, but at no time did they accept him as the infallible head of the whole church. Not only did St. Jerome denounce Pope Liberius for having subscribed to heretical perversity, but even councils and popes have declared popes to be heretics. The most notorious example is the case of Pope Honorius. The background was the Monophysite heresy, which claimed that though Jesus had a true human body, he did not have a true human nature, only a divine one. To many, this seemed to be a revival of the old Docetist heresy denounced by the Apostle John, in which Jesus was less than truly human. The Council of Chalcedon had denounced the Monophysites in the year 451 and affirmed the biblical teaching that Jesus was fully human and fully divine in his incarnation. But the churches were still divided over the issue in the 7th century. In an attempt to reconcile the parties, Sergius, the patriarch of Constantinople, proposed that though Christ has two distinct natures, he had only one will. In place of monophysitism, he offered monothelitism. Sophronius, the patriarch of Jerusalem, denounced this compromise as simply a repackaging of the old heresy. Sergius then reached out to Pope Honorius, who joined him in rebuking Sophronius. Honorius wrote, We confess one will of our Lord Jesus Christ. Since our human nature was plainly assumed by the Godhead, and this being faultless, as it was before the fall. For forty years, monothletism ruled the church until the Catholic faith was restored at the Third Council of Constantinople. This sixth ecumenical council anathematized the three previous patriarchs there, along with Pope Honorius. And with these we define that there shall be expelled from the Holy Church of God an anathematized Honorius, who was sometime Pope of old Rome, because of what we found written by him to Sergius, that in all respects he followed his view and confirmed his impious doctrines. To Sergius the heretic, anathema. To Cyrus the heretic, anathema. To Honorius the heretic, anathema. To Pyrrhus the heretic, anathema. Modern apologists for Rome would have us believe that the Church always understood councils to be subject to popes but this was the second ecumenical council to excommunicate a pope. A century earlier, Pope Vigilius repented when he was excommunicated by the second council of Constantinople. In this case, Pope Honorius was already dead when he was declared a heretic. Defenders of papal infallibility claimed that the council's excommunication was not supported by Pope Leo II because he used slightly different words to anathematize Honorius. They stress that Leo only condemned Honorius for permitting the faith to be subverted. In other words, his was a sin of omission, not commission. They see Leo's language as a subtle rebuke to the ecumenical council for daring to denounce an infallible pope as a heretic. This flies in the face of the facts. Leo had the acts of the council, including its declaration that Pope Honorius was a heretic translated into Latin and signed by all the bishops of the West. Besides this, the papal oath taken by every pope from the 9th to 11th century 
smites with eternal anathema the originators of the new heresy, Sergius, etc., together with Honorius, because he assisted the base assertion of the heretics. For two centuries, every pope entered office by denouncing his predecessor as an active heretic, not merely a negligent pope. The history of the papacy is filled with scandals that undermine Rome's claims to infallibility. Based on the supposed donation of Constantine, popes in the 8th century claim not only spiritual but political authority over the whole world. These claims would continue until the donation was shown to be a forgery in the 15th century. In the year 896, Pope Formosus died. The next year, Pope Stephen VI had his corpse dug up dressed in papal vestments, and put on trial. After denouncing Formosus, the vestments were torn from his body, the three fingers from his right hand used in consecrations were cut off, and his body was dragged through the streets of Rome before being thrown into the Tiber. Soon after, Pope Stephen himself was strangled by a Roman mob. This was followed in the 10th century by what is known as the papal pornocracy, or the rule of harlots. The papacy was bought and sold, and according to the Bishop of Cremona, the mistress of two different popes murdered the second and had her son by the first made pope. She later had her grandson made pope when he was but 18 years old. The 11th century found Pope Victor III describing his predecessor Benedict IX's rapes, murders, and other unspeakable acts of violence and sodomy. His life as a pope was so vile so foul, so execrable, that I shudder to think of it, he said. In the 14th century, Pope Clement V moved the papacy to Avignon, France. This led to competing popes in Avignon, Rome, and Pisa. The issue was eventually ended by throwing out the existing popes and electing a new one. During the Renaissance, the papacy was largely in control of the Borgias and Medicis, creating enough scandal to delight cable television audiences to this day. Pope Leo X, who excommunicated Martin Luther, was made a cardinal at the age of 13 as part of a deal for his older brother to marry the Pope's illegitimate daughter. If they are aware of such things, Roman Catholics rationalize that since the Roman Church still exists after all these scandals, it must be true. They ignore that Jerusalem, Antioch, and Alexandria are also apostolic sees that are older than Rome. They still exist. Rome may be larger, but Islam is much larger than Roman Catholicism and has existed for over 1,400 years. Catholics tend to ignore anything that contradicts the claims of Rome. Most importantly, they ignore the scriptures and the actual writings of the Church Fathers. Like Peter Lombard, Defenders of Roman Catholicism continue to cobble together supposed proof texts from the Bible and the Church Fathers, ignoring context and anything that contradicts their position. They argue that though popes are not without sin, they are still infallible when they speak ex cathedra, or as the bishop of the whole church. Though papal infallibility has been official dogma since 1870, popes of the past had no such ideas. The first Dutchman to serve as Pope, Adrian VI, said, I hold that if by Roman Church we understand the head, that is, the Pope, it is obvious that he can be in error, even when it comes to those things which touch on the faith, by promulgating heresy through his own private judgment or through decree. For there have been many heretical Roman Popes. In a similar fashion, it is also very recently reported that John the Twenty Second publicly taught and declared and ordered all the faithful to hold that souls which have been purged before the Last Judgment do not possess glorification, that is, the beatific vision of God. And it is reported that he compelled the University of Paris to agree to this because no one in that institution was allowed to earn a degree in theology unless he had first sworn that he would defend this toxic error and maintain it perpetually. If Roman apologists try to defend the infallibility of Pope John XXII, they end up being confronted by the fact that he also denied papal infallibility. In 1324, 
The Franciscans sought to limit John's power by insisting that he could not change what previous popes had decided in matters of faith and morals. Pope John responded, They say that that which the Roman pontiffs had defined by the key of knowledge in faith and morals, once for all, persists unchangeable to such an extent that it's not lawful for a successor to call it again into doubt, nor to affirm the contrary. Whosoever truly should presume this, let him be treated as contumacious and a rebel of the Roman Church by all the faithful. The simple fact is that papal infallibility is not the ancient and constant faith of the universal church. What Rome teaches today is not old and Catholic, but relatively speaking new and novel. It claims its theology has grown as an oak from an acorn. But the reality is that even what it taught before Vatican II was contrary to the historic and biblical faith of the church. This is especially seen in the dogmas concerning the Virgin Mary. In 1854, Pope Pius declared dogmatically that she had been immaculately conceived. He said that Mary, like Jesus, was born without original sin. This doctrine always existed in the Church as a doctrine that has been received from our ancestors and that has been stamped with the character of revealed doctrine. This official dogma was contrary to the explicit teaching of seven previous popes, along with doctors of the Church such as St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas. It was also based on an embarrassing ignorance of the Scriptures. Pope Pius said, All our hope we do repose in the most blessed Virgin, in the all-fair and immaculate one who has crushed the poisonous head of the most cruel serpent and brought salvation to the world. Pope Pius's claim is based on a mistranslation of the original Hebrew in the Old Latin Vulgate. The modern Vulgate correctly renders the original Hebrew as referring not to the woman, but her seed. It is not Mary who bruises the head of the serpent, but Jesus. Despite such confusion in his reading of the Bible, Pope Pius represented this as a dogma that absolutely had to be believed. Hence, If anyone shall dare, which God forbid, to think otherwise than as has been defined by us, let him know and understand that he is condemned by his own judgment, that he has suffered shipwreck in the faith, that he has separated from the unity of the Church. Six hundred years earlier, Pope Innocent III seems to have been unaware that he was making shipwreck of the faith when he described the Virgin Mary. Eve was produced without sin, but she brought forth in sin. Mary was produced in sin, but she brought forth without sin. Not only does Rome claim that Mary crushed the serpent's head instead of Christ, but over the centuries, Rome has declared Mary to be more and more like Jesus. The Bible declares Jesus the only mediator between God and man. But during the Middle Ages, Mary began to be called a co-mediator, or mediatrix. Jesus was born without original sin, and in 1854, Mary was declared to have been as well. Jesus was assumed bodily into heaven, and in 1950, Mary was declared to have been as well. Today, many in Rome declare Mary a co-redeemer with Jesus as well. Mary, the highly favored, has become the dispenser of favors. The humble handmaid of the Lord has been declared the Queen of Heaven. As much as Rome's apologists seek to explain away its historic novelties and the heresies of its popes, they are now being confronted by something harder to explain away, Pope Francis. On April 8, 2016, Pope Francis released Amoris Laetitia, or The Joy of Love. He announced that for the first time, civilly remarried couples may be admitted back into the Catholic Communion. He hinted at more changes to come. Conservative Catholic theologians responded by making a filial correction of the Pope, in which they accused him of six specific charges of teaching heresy. The last time such a thing took place was in the year 1333. The charges are so serious that Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, the Prefect Emeritus of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, 
called for a theological disputation between the Pope and his critics. Pope Francis responded by removing Mueller from office. On August 24, 2017, Pope Francis declared, We can affirm with certainty and magisterial authority that the liturgical reform is irreversible. The Pope is clearly speaking ex cathedra, with magisterial authority, contradicting previous popes on what they declared with magisterial authority. On December 31, 2017, three bishops declared Amoris Laetitia alien to the Catholic faith. It is no longer just the Protestant reformers and popes from the past who deny papal infallibility, but apparently even modern Catholic bishops as well. While most Catholics shrug off such matters, others pray that God will bring back the Catholicism of their grandparents. The simple fact is that no one is the successor of Peter unless he teaches the faith of Peter. It is not just what Francis teaches that is alien to the Catholic faith, but even what his more traditional critics teach as well. Popes and councils have repeatedly contradicted one another, not just on peripheral issues, but on the very nature of the gospel. There is only one authority that does not contradict itself, the direct testimony of the prophets and apostles found in what the Apostle Paul calls the God-breathed scriptures. How do we know what the apostles actually taught? Rome claims to hold to three equally infallible authorities, sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and the magisterium of the church. The Protestant reformers agreed that tradition and the church have authority, but not infallibly. They believed that scripture alone was infallible. In Latin, their position is known as sola scriptura. Despite Rome's assertions of having three authorities, their source and infallible interpreter of the scriptures is the church. Their source and infallible interpreter of tradition is also the church. So at every turn, it is really the church that is their final authority. Instead of sola scriptura, Rome essentially holds to sola ecclesia, the church alone as its standard. Claims to the church being infallible are difficult to maintain when councils and even popes have denounced one another as heretics. But let's look at Rome's claims for having an infallible sacred tradition. The church is proposing to us the fact that the entire deposit of faith has been transmitted to us, some in writing, as St. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, some in writing and some in oral form, but we are charged to hold fast to both. Rome's oral tradition has never been clearly defined. It does not offer a single direct quotation from Jesus or the apostles, and yet it is seen as trumping the plain reading of the Bible. The Protestant reformers did not question the authority of the apostles' oral teachings, simply the preservation of them. They recognized that claims of oral tradition had long been used to undermine the scriptures. In the late second century, St. Irenaeus complained about the Gnostics' appeal to such oral traditions. When, however, they are confuted from the scriptures, they turn round and accuse these same scriptures as if they were not correct, nor of authority, and assert that they are ambiguous, and that the truth cannot be extracted from them by those who are ignorant of tradition. For they allege that the truth was not delivered by means of written documents, but orally. Irenaeus did not deny the importance of tradition. He readily appealed to the testimonies of faithful men who had been taught by the apostles, but he also recognized that there was a standard by which all tradition should be judged. We have learned from none others the plan of our salvation than from those through whom the gospel has come down to us, which they did at one time proclaim in public and at a later period, by the will of God, handed down to us in the Scriptures to be the ground and pillar of our faith. 
The Apostle Paul called the church the pillar and ground of the truth. But Irenaeus goes so far as to call the scriptures the ground and pillar of our faith. Few Roman Catholics would echo his sentiments. Since they believe the church alone can infallibly interpret it, the Bible is generally seen as simply a supplement to what the church teaches. As reasonable as they may think this, it is not how Jesus treated the scriptures. When challenged by representatives of the high priest, Jesus condemned them. Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. The high priest had authority, but he was fallible. Jesus corrects him and the church of that day by the infallible word of God in the scriptures. The Pharisees also claimed to have oral traditions, traditions that had been handed down from Moses, without which they said the scriptures could not be properly understood. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashen hands? He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honour thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered. And many such like things do ye. The Pharisees' traditions were not from Moses, nor from God. They were counterfeits that led people away from what God had actually said in the Scriptures. The whole point of writing down the revelations of God was to preserve them and provide an objective standard against such hearsay. Jesus expected people to read the Bible for themselves and do what God commanded in it, rather than blindly submitting themselves to man-made traditions. The Bereans were committed in the book of Acts because they did not accept even the apostles' teachings without searching the scriptures to know whether they were true. Roman Catholic apologists claim that when Irenaeus or any church father appealed to tradition, they were explicitly rejecting sola scriptura. They ignore that tradition simply means what is handed down, whether orally or in writing. Scripture was not only part of what the fathers call tradition, but the infallible measure for the rest. In the third century, St. Cyprian, the bishop of Carthage, said, What obstinacy is that, or what presumption, to prefer human tradition to divine ordinance, and not to observe that God is indignant and angry, as often as human tradition relaxes and passes by the divine precepts, as he cries out and says by Isaiah the prophet, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching the doctrines and commandments of men. Also the Lord in the gospel, similarly rebuking and reproving, utters and says, Ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Vermilion, the bishop of Caesarea, agreed and wrote to Cyprian, They who are at Rome do not observe those things in all cases, which are handed down from the beginning, and vainly pretend the authority of the apostles. A doctor of the church, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, said, For concerning the divine and holy mysteries of the faith, not even a casual statement must be delivered without the holy scriptures. Nor must we be drawn aside by mere plausibility and artifices of speech. Even to me, who tell you these things, give not absolute credence, unless you receive the proof of the things which I announce from the divine scriptures. 
For this salvation which we believe depends not on ingenious reasoning, but on demonstration of the Holy Scriptures. Another doctor of the Church, St. John Chrysostom, said, For how is it not absurd that in respect to money, indeed, we do not trust to others, but refer these figures and calculations, but in calculating upon facts we are lightly drawn aside by the notions of others, and that too, though we process an exact balance and square and rule for all things the declaration of the divine laws. Wherefore I exhort and entreat you all, disregard what is man and that man thinks about these things, and inquire from the scriptures all these things. And yet another doctor of the church, St. Augustine, said, The reasonings of any men whatsoever, even though they be Catholics and of high reputation, are not to be treated by us in the same way as the canonical scriptures are treated. We are at liberty, without doing any violence to the respect which these men deserve, to condemn and reject anything in their writings, if perchance we shall find that they have entertained opinions differing from that which others or we ourselves have, by the divine help, discovered to be the truth. We could offer many other examples, but most of the church fathers subordinated what had been handed down orally to what had been handed down in writing. Despite its claims of a unanimous consent of the fathers, Rome picks and chooses what it recognizes as sacred tradition. St. Irenaeus is championed when he praises the orthodoxy of the Roman Church, but he is ignored when he states that it was an apostolic tradition that Jesus was nearly 50 years old when he died. When Tertullian agrees with Rome, he is championed as a faithful early Christian, but when he disagrees, we are reminded he became a heretical Montanist. For Roman Catholics, it is the infallible Church that defines infallible tradition and infallible Scripture. For Protestants, it is the infallible scriptures which correct a fallible church and its fallible traditions. A common claim of Rome is that without an infallible church, Protestants would not even have a Bible. Protestants believe the Bible is the only source for determining Christian truth. This doctrine is called sola scriptura, which is Latin for scripture alone. But did you know that this fundamental doctrine of Protestantism is incoherent? Let me explain. Notice the doctrine presupposes knowledge of what Scriptura is, those books inspired by God that belong in the Bible. But if the Bible is the only source of Christian truth, well then, we couldn't have such knowledge. Why? Because the Bible never tells us which books are inspired. If sola Scriptura were true, well then, we couldn't know what Scripture is. Do you see how it's self-refuting? Even if the Bible did give us a list of inspired books, and we believed the Bible was inspired, well, we couldn't accept that list lest we'd be guilty of circular reasoning. For example, why do you believe the biblical books are inspired? Because they say they're inspired. Well, why do you believe them when they say that? Because they're inspired. <laughs> the only way to acknowledge the inspiration of Scripture and avoid circular reasoning is to appeal to an infallible church established by Christ that tells us which books are inspired. Do you notice how Mr. Brizard misrepresents Sola Scriptura? Unless Protestants recognize tradition and the church is infallible, they supposedly ignore them entirely. Let's think through what Mr. Brizard is saying. When Timothy delivered an epistle from the Apostle Paul, was a church council necessary to give that letter authority? Did the church need to be infallible to recognize that an epistle came by the hand of one of Paul's fellow workers, clearly reminding the church of what Paul had previously taught them and bearing Paul's signature? Did the church in Rome have to be infallible to recognize Paul's epistle even when he showed up later and verified it? Mr. Broussard's argument turns the Bible on its head. The epistles were explicitly written to fallible churches by apostles with divine authority to correct them. Before the time of Christ, the Pharisees had claimed the authority to bind and to loose, 
to authoritatively interpret the Old Testament. The apostles actually had that authority, given them by Jesus. The church did not gain equal or greater authority simply by recognizing that an epistle came from an apostle and was to be obeyed, nor did the church gain infallible authority simply by differentiating the writings it received from the hands of the apostles from the obvious counterfeits put forward by Gnostics a century later. Protestants and Catholics agree on what constitutes the New Testament. The simple claim of Protestants is that the Apostles' writings are to define the Church, not the other way around. Mr. Broussard argues that Sola Scriptura is circular in its reasoning and self-refuting. He says that we can only know that Scripture is infallible if an infallible Church tells us it is. So how do we know the Church is infallible? He says Jesus established an infallible Church, but he never mentions how we are to know that. He is essentially arguing that we know the church is true because the church tells us it's true. Rome regularly uses such double standards in its criticism, applying radical skepticism to its opponents while ignoring what such skepticism would do to its own claims. Rome will argue that not all books of the New Testament were recognized by everyone in the first centuries of the church. This is supposed to undermine the authority of the scriptures, but they fail to see the difficulty this creates for a supposedly infallible church. Some, such as Scott Hahn, will raise issues about the reliability of the New Testament text. He insists this makes sola scriptura impossible, while failing to recognize that if the church has not preserved the text of the apostles' written teachings, we should not trust them to have preserved anything else either. Rome admits that the scriptures have been faithfully maintained and are the infallible word of God. Yet they argue that without an infallible church, the Bible only leads to the chaos of 40,000 denominations. The Reformation has led to such chaos, nobody really knows how many denominations there are, right? You have the Oxford World Christian Encyclopedia, which is a, a Protestant group that has done the best work that I know of in trying to decipher how many and According to their numbers, we're up over 40,000 denominations. Then a renegade priest, an Augustinian friar, Father Martin Luther, lashed out at the corruption he saw in the church and shortly after went off the rails, denying virtually all the truths of the church in the process. From this point forward, Christianity would be split between Catholics and Protestants, of which there are more than 40,000 individual denominations each with its own major divisions. These figures come from the Center for the Study of Global Christianity at Gordon-Conwell Seminary. The center estimates that in 2017 there were roughly 47,000 Christian denominations in the world. But that number is not what the Catholics represent it to be. Each country in which a denomination functions is counted separately, so the numbers are grossly inflated. Roman Catholicism, which is one denomination, is counted 237 times, since it exists in nearly every country and there are multiple organizations of it in some countries. Eastern Orthodox groups are counted over 1,000 times. Any group that claims to be Christian is counted no matter what their view of the Bible. Like the Mormons who are counted 185 times, most deny Sola Scriptura. And like Rome, subordinate the Bible to some additional prophet or their own personal revelations. Just as there were differences among the Church Fathers, there are differences even among those who see themselves as the heirs of the Reformation. But Rome ignores the massive confusion in its own ranks. Do they really have unity in worship? Are polka masses, clown masses, and Latin masses all truly Catholic? Why is it a mortal sin in some parts of the world to eat meat on Fridays, but not in the United States? Why is it a mortal sin in some dioceses to kneel after the Agnus Dei? Do Roman Catholics really have unity in morals either? They may give lip service to the authority of the Pope, but do they obey him in matters of birth control? How about homosexuality? The Catholic Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, calls homosexual marriage one of his core principles. In the United States, it was Catholic Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy who was the deciding vote in discovering a constitutional right to homosexual marriage. Former Vice President, Catholic Joe Biden, has performed a homosexual marriage. 
And Catholic House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi says that homosexuality is perfectly consistent with Catholicism. There are those who call themselves Protestants, who also celebrate homosexuality, but only by rejecting God's clear revelation in the Bible. Their apostasy has brought the kinds of division that Rome loves to criticize. But Jesus promised he would bring division between those who would follow him and those who would not. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. The Apostle Paul told the church in Corinth to cast out the sexually immoral man. At the time of the Reformation, that would have included the Pope. But Rome has exempted itself from the Bible for a very long time. Just as the Pharisees allowed their traditions to lead them further and further from the truth, so has Rome. A plurality of elders gave way to a single bishop. Over time, the claims of that bishop grew and grew until he claimed to be the voice of God for the whole church. As Rome became increasingly corrupt and oppressive, men appealed to the Bible for reform. In the 12th century, it was Peter Waldo in Italy. The response of the Pope was to imprison and kill his followers as heretics. Thousands were burned at the stake for appealing to the Bible against the Pope of Rome. Rome sought to avoid correction by taking the Bible out of the hands of lay people and burning their Bibles. The Council of Toulouse in 1229 decreed, We prohibit also that the laity should be permitted to have the books of the Old and the New Testament, unless anyone from the motives of devotion should wish to have the Psalter or the Breviary for divine offices or the hours of the Blessed Virgin, but we most strictly forbid their having any translation of these books. Much of the lead-up to the Protestant Reformation can be understood as attempts to give the Bible back to the laity. In the 14th century, it was John Wycliffe who translated the Bible from the Latin Vulgate into English. This inspired John Huss of Bohemia who translated the Bible into Czech. At the Council of Constance in 1415, Huss was burned at the stake and it was decreed that the bones of Wycliffe should be dug up and burned and the ashes thrown into the River Swift. The Protestant Reformation was really nothing new, but part of a long battle to bring the actual teachings of the apostles against the increasing claims and corruptions of Rome. In my opinion, John has bought with his own blood the gospel which we now possess. In the time of Luther, Agents of the Pope were selling indulgences to pay for the decadence of Rome. Luther protested against Rome's abuses as others had before him, but he had one thing Wycliffe and Huss did not, a printing press. Soon the Reformation swept Europe, and the Pope called for the slaughter of the Protestants, who cited the Scriptures in challenging his authority. In the Sala Regia, the antechamber to the Sistine Chapel, is a fresco celebrating the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre that began on the evening of August 23, 1572. French Protestants called Huguenot were lured to Paris with promises of peace. They were met with treachery. Protestants in Paris were slaughtered and the mob soon took to the countryside. According to the Archbishop of Paris, 100,000 men, women, and children were killed. Witnesses describe the Seine choked with bodies, including babies. The severed head of Protestant Admiral Coligny was sent to Pope Gregory XIII. The Pope responded by sending the king a golden rose. The Pope then ordered a Te Deum to be sung as a special thanksgiving, and he had a medal struck. On the one side was his portrait. On the other was a picture of an angel killing Protestants, along with the motto, Ugonatorum Stragis, slaughter of the Huguenot. The Pope then commissioned a fresco celebrating the massacre that decorates the Vatican to this day. This was only one of the slaughters called for and celebrated by the Pope. Rome's war against the laity being able to read the Bible for themselves did not end in the 16th century. Even at the end of the 19th century, Pope Leo XIII declared, All versions of the Holy Bible in any vernacular language made by non-Catholics are prohibited, and especially those published by the Bible societies 
which have been more than once condemned by the Roman pontiffs, because in them the wise laws of the Church concerning the publication of the sacred books are entirely disregarded. Since the 1960s, such prohibitions have been largely ignored, because time has proven that when given the opportunity, most Catholics will spend very little time studying the Bible. It's much easier to do what you're told by a supposedly infallible church. Part of the appeal of Rome is that to a great extent, it allows its members to make of their faith whatever they like, so long as they confess the Pope as their head. For those who take the Bible seriously, its message is abundantly clear. God defines the Christian faith. His definition cannot be edited to suit ourselves. And by his standard, not only is the Pope not Catholic, but neither is the faith Rome proclaims. Pope Francis tells Catholics that the Jews are their elder brothers in the faith. Jesus used very different language. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication, we have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil. Jesus told the church in Smyrna, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Blasphemy from religious Jews can seem a strange concept to modern Catholics, who think that even sincere Muslims, Hindus, and atheists are going to heaven. But when the Jews refuse to accept God's revelation of his Messiah, he sees even their most devoted worship as sacrilege. Unwittingly, Pope Francis has put his finger on the fundamental issues the Protestant reformers had with Rome. Like Judaism, Catholicism has subjected the scriptures to man-made traditions and presumes to worship God according to its imagination. The constant temptation for Israel was to worship God not as he prescribed, but according to their own sinful desires. The pagans had gods they could see, and Israel longed to be like them. They also introduced the worship of lesser gods that they thought were more approachable than Jehovah. In all this, they ignored how seriously God takes his worship. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. Here were God's anointed priest, offering worship to him, but not in the way he commanded. They knew the word of God, but they convinced themselves they knew better. Nadab and Abihu weren't seeking to draw near to God, but merely to pacify him and to quiet their consciences. They thought God looked only on their actions and not on their sinful hearts. Although they never would have admitted it to themselves, what appeared to be an act of worship was actually an act of presumption and rebellion. God insists he will be treated as holy by all who approach him. He was not pleased with such worship. The fire of the Lord went out and turned his priest into the incense. God has never been pleased with people presuming to come to him on their terms. He did not accept Cain's sacrifice, because Cain did not first deal with his sins through the shedding of blood. 
Cain showed the real condition of his heart by refusing correction and killing his brother whose worship was according to the word of God. Unconverted people want to escape God's wrath and seek his blessing. Some even seek to draw near to a God of their own imagination. But to truly draw near to the God of the Bible is to be confronted by the darkness in ourselves. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Rather than facing that light, our great temptation is to suppress our knowledge of God and to imagine that we can remake him into what we want him to be. It is this desire that leads us to approach God through idols. Despite the fact that God rejects such worship over and over in the Bible, Roman Catholics maintain that God actually encourages worship through images. What about the graven image? Now, God didn't completely prohibit making images. One, in the Old Testament, he, he uh, conscripts the Israelites to fashion angels over the top of the Ark of the Covenant. He tells Moses to make a bronze serpent on a staff, and those who look at the bronze serpent on that staff will become healed. Father Schmitz ignores that when the people of Israel began to burn incense to the bronze serpent, King Hezekiah destroyed it as part of his war against idolatry, a war for which God commended him in the Bible. He also ignores that the Ark was kept in the Holy of Holies, where it was normally seen only by the high priest and only once a year. He takes no notice of when Israel made the ark an idol, trusting in it rather than in the God whose word it contained. In the days of Eli, God gave Israel over to defeat by the Philistines. Instead of seeking to be reconciled to God, Israel presumed to take the ark into battle, confident that God would be forced to give them victory. Instead, God brought them an even greater defeat and gave the ark into the hands of their enemies. The Ark of the Covenant is possibly the worst example to use for rationalizing away God's explicit commands. When it was returned by the Philistines, God killed the men of Beth Shemesh who presumed to look inside it. Later, King David established his capital at Jerusalem and sent for the Ark to be brought there. Filled with joy at its coming, David danced before it. In his enthusiasm, David ignored what God had said in Exodus about transporting the Ark. God had said it was to be carried with poles. Nowhere did God prohibit putting the ark on a cart, so David did what seemed reasonable to him rather than what God had specifically commanded. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. As different as Uzzah's sin was from Nadab and Abihu, the result was the same. The God of the Bible will be treated as holy by all who approach him, and his word must be obeyed. Like the Jews, Father Schmitz takes two passages of Scripture out of context to rationalize ignoring what God clearly commands elsewhere. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. For all the distinctions Rome tries to create between worship and veneration, Latria and Duia, the commandment is against even bowing down to such images. Rome tries to insist the prohibition is only in relation to the worship of other gods, but God had already dealt with that in verse 3. Here he prohibits even his own worship through the use of images. The golden calf was not meant to represent a different god. Aaron told the people that it was the God who brought them out of the land of Egypt. He built an altar before it and declared a feast to Jehovah. God was not pleased. So great was his wrath at such idolatry that Moses had to intercede to keep the Lord from destroying all the people. Even after that intercession, 
A judgment was still required on the nation. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about three thousand men. In his first epistle to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul groups idolaters with adulterers and homosexuals as those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. Such is the seriousness of the sin of rejecting God's word and how he is to be worshipped. God describes those who approach him through images as hating him. Idolaters convince themselves they love God, but God calls them liars. As much as they may fool themselves, they do not fool him. The golden calf was not made out of a love for God, but rebellion against him. Like Nadab and Abihu, idolaters make a show of religion, but cannot bear to recognize God for who he really is. Behind their mask of piety is a hatred of the real God. Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God which he made with you, and make you a graven image or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Images evoke emotion, because they make God seem closer and more approachable. They stress His eminence, but at the expense of His transcendence, at the expense of His true glory. Israel was tempted to the gods of the Canaanites because they were not so great nor so holy. They were not so convicting to their worshippers, nor did they require their followers to love them with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. To truly understand Jehovah's holiness is to be confronted with our own sinfulness and to despair of any righteousness of our own. When the prophet Isaiah saw a vision of the Lord upon his throne, with his glory filling the temple, even the holy angels had to cover their faces in his presence. As they cried, Holy, 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 the whole earth is filled with his glory, Isaiah cried out, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He goes on to say, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. The Jews rationalized that images brought them closer to God, but they were actually a way to keep from drawing near, to avoid seeing themselves as God saw them. Not only did their images not please God, but they brought his judgment upon them. Because Manasseh king of Judah hath done these abominations, and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols, therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. Rather than seeing his worship profaned any more, God sent the Babylonians to destroy his temple. As part of his judgment, most of his covenant people were slaughtered. The surviving remnant was then exiled from the promised land for seventy years. As with Nadab, Abihu, and Uzzah, the holiness of God was made abundantly clear. When Israel finally returned, they forsook the outward trappings of their idolatry. But for most, their religion remained a means to hide from a holy God. Instead of truly drawing near to God, 
The Jews fixated on outward shows of religion and added man-made traditions to the Word of God. Jesus condemned them. Ye hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. The Apostle Paul described the Jews as having a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Their problem was not a lack of religion, nor even a lack of fervor, but the hardness of their hearts, their refusal to hear the word of God from the scriptures, and trusting in religious ceremonies. Jesus told them, And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. In the early church, Jesus' call to total devotion was well understood. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Though some were clear about the cost of real discipleship, many were tempted like Israel to draw near to God with their lips while their hearts were far from him. There were even some who called for the worship of God through images, as Israel had done in the past. This did not go unchallenged. About the year 305, the Synod of Elvira declared, There shall be no pictures in the church, lest what is worshipped and adored should be depicted on the walls. Catholics may be tempted to object by appealing to St. Veronica and the image of Christ celebrated in the sixth station of the cross. But this is an unbiblical legend that arose in the 11th century, a thousand years after the fact. By the year 313, Christianity had been declared legal throughout the empire, and Constantia, the sister of the Emperor Constantine, sent word to Bishop Eusebius of Caesarea that she desired an image of Jesus. The bishop responded, What sort of image are you seeking? Is it the true and unalterable one which bears his essential characteristics, or the one which he took up for our sake when he assumed the form of a servant? After explaining the impossibility of art capturing the glory of God, he went on, But if you mean to ask of me the image, not of his form transformed into that of God, but that of the mortal flesh before its transformation, can it be that you have forgotten that passage in which God lays down the law, that no likeness should be made either of what is in heaven or what is in the earth beneath? By the year 380, Emperor Theodosius declared Christianity the only legal religion in the Roman Empire. Many people flooded the churches not out of changed hearts, but a desire for privilege and popularity. Rather than being remade by the message of Jesus, many tried to remake Christianity into what they wanted it to be. They increased the pressure on the church to allow idolatrous worship, but still some bishops opposed them. Around the year 394, St. Epiphanius, the bishop of Salamis, wrote to the bishop of Jerusalem about stumbling upon a building. Learning it to be a church, I went in to pray, and found there a curtain hanging on the doors of the said church, dyed and embroidered. It bore an image, either of Christ or of one of the saints. I do not rightly remember whose image it was. Seeing this, and being low that an image of a man should be hung up in Christ's church, contrary to the teaching of the scriptures, I tore it asunder and advised the custodians of the place to use it as a burial shroud for some poor person. Long before the Protestant Reformation, bishops warned of the dangers of worshiping God according to our own sinful desires, especially in pretending to draw near to him through idols. 
In the year 754, 333 bishops met in council at Constantinople. They declared to those who would make images of Jesus, If anyone ventures to represent the divine image of the Word after the incarnation with material colors, let him be anathema. If anyone ventures to represent in human figures by means of material colors, by reason of the incarnation, the substance or person of the Word, which cannot be depicted, and does not rather confess that even after the incarnation he cannot be depicted, let him be anathema. The decisions of this council were reversed by a later council, only to be reaffirmed by another, and then reversed yet again. Rome will sometimes dismiss this as a Byzantine issue, yet the Italian bishop Claudius of Turin espoused the very same position in the ninth century. The call of the Protestant reformers to worship God according to his word in the Bible was neither new nor novel. It was the call of true Catholicism, to draw near to the real God on his terms, directly through Jesus Christ. Rome proposes all manner of ways to avoid that, it offers images to remake God into what we want him to be. And instead of going directly to Jesus, it substitutes the intercession of dead saints and the sacraments of living priest. Rome says that since God calls us to pray for one another, we should also ask dead saints to pray for us as well, especially Mary. Once again, they take a passage out of context to avoid the clear teaching of Scripture elsewhere. They also ignore the clear testimony of the early church. Despite Mary's popularity in modern Rome, we find no prayers to her in any of the writings of the early church until the end of the 4th century. We find no prayers to her in St. Clement of Rome or any of the apostolic fathers. None in St. Irenaeus, Tertullian, nor any of the 2nd or 3rd century fathers. None in St. Athanasius, St. Augustine, or St. Chrysostom in the 4th century. Some claim they have prayers to Mary from these fathers, but they are from writings that even Roman Catholic scholars admit are spurious. Like the Donation of Constantine, they are much later forgeries. In trying to claim that their tradition is actually Catholic, many point to an undated papyrus they say proves that there were prayers to Mary much earlier. How does an undated papyrus do that? One scholar said that the form of handwriting indicates that it could have been written as early as the year 250. Catholic apologists ignore all the evidence that leads most scholars to date the papyrus to a century and a half later. The modern prayers to Mary were not only unknown in the early church, but many of the trappings of her veneration are of even much more recent invention. The use of a rosary didn't arise until the 15th century when a monk claimed that Mary had appeared to St. Dominic 200 years earlier and commanded its use. The current form of the Ave Maria appears nowhere in print until the year 1495. Mary has always been honored in the church, but the way that she has rivaled and even supplanted Jesus as the focus of devotion is contrary to the Bible and the historic Catholic faith. And it came to pass, as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee, and the paps which thou hast sucked. But he said, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God, and keep it. As to the sacraments, Rome claims that it has the power to give new birth through water baptism. Just as the Jews confused the outward circumcision of their flesh with the spiritual circumcision of their hearts, Rome confuses the outward baptism of water with the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. In the third chapter of John's Gospel, Nicodemus, a Jewish Pharisee, came to Jesus by night. Jesus said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. 
That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Like the Jews, Rome has confused the outward sign with the spiritual reality. The new birth involves much more than baptism with water. The prophet Ezekiel says, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Rome's baptism does not give a new heart, nor does it make its people walk in God's statutes. Instead, it points them to rosaries and scapulars, things found nowhere in God's Word. It leads them to think that only unconfessed mortal sins will put them in hell, but purgatory can cleanse them of venial ones. Ideas again found nowhere in the Bible. It emphasizes Mary, its priest, and its sacraments instead of Jesus. The biblical new birth is fundamentally at odds with Rome's thinking, because whatever the effects of Adam's fall might have been, they believe man's will was left intact. At the Council of Trent, Rome declared, If anyone saith that since Adam's sin the free will of man is lost and extinguished, or that it is a thing with only a name, yea, a name without a reality, a figment in fine, introduced into the church by Satan, let him be anathema. The biblical picture of an unconverted person is much darker. He has free will, but only to act according to his sinful nature. God says the thoughts of his heart are only evil continually. The things of God are foolishness to him. He is a slave to sin, dead in trespasses and sins. His heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. The Bible makes clear that a new heart is necessary to believe on God. It comes not from an unbeliever making use of the sacraments, but God raising the spiritually dead to life. Have you ever wondered why so few Jews believed on Jesus? The Apostle Paul answers that question in his epistle to the Romans. Having spent eight chapters carefully laying open the gospel, he concludes by describing the blessedness of those who come to Jesus in faith. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He anticipates the objection. Then what about the Jews? Who has separated them from the love of God? The Jews had been seeking to kill Paul. They had done all they could to oppose him. They had him stoned and left for dead, beaten and imprisoned. Yet just as Jesus loved his enemies, Paul loved his and could even wish himself accursed if it meant their salvation. But the fact that they did not believe was not a failure on God's part. He responds in chapter 9. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. Paul makes the radical statement that not all of Israel was Israel. Being truly part of God's people was not simply a matter of birth or even of circumcision. Abraham had fathered Ishmael by Hagar, but God made it clear that he would give him a son by Sarah, and his covenant would be with Isaac, not Ishmael. Both were sons of Abraham, both were circumcised, but only one was chosen. Paul goes on, and not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, 
for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Isaac and Ishmael had only been half-brothers, but Jacob and Esau were twins by the same parents. Both were sinners. Both deserved only God's wrath. But Paul reminds us of what God spoke through Malachi. He loved one while hating the other. Not for anything they had done, but for his own purposes. Again, Paul anticipates the objection of his reader. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. How can God love one and hate the other? Isn't that unfair? No. God gives Esau what he deserves, while showing undeserved mercy to Jacob. God is under no obligation to show mercy to everyone. He says it is his free choice. Paul goes on. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Over and over in the book of Exodus, we are told that God hardened Pharaoh's heart not to let the children of Israel go free. This was not God making a good man do evil, but taking away the restraints on the evil in Pharaoh, and then judging him when his sin came to full flower. Once again, Paul anticipates the objection of his readers. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? To a great extent, this was the fundamental issue of the Protestant Reformation. Who is the potter? God or the Catholic Church? Rome claims the authority to bind God so that he must forgive any sins they remit. He must regenerate those it baptizes. Though they may not be directly selling indulgences as in the 16th century, it is still a matter on whom the Roman Church has mercy, not God. They have grossly exaggerated what God says about church authority. Rather than Rome making the way broad for one-fifth of the world's population, the Bible tells us the way is narrow and the gate is straight. Few find it, because it is ultimately God who shows mercy, as He sees fit. The gospel was never about saving all of Israel according to the flesh, but an elect remnant. It was not about creating a state church in which religious ceremonies saved everyone who did what Rome told them. It was about God raising the spiritually dead to life, giving them new hearts and putting His Spirit within them. The Gospel of Rome is about men with free will meriting the grace of God through the sacraments. The Gospel of the Bible is about men who are dead in their sin being born again and fleeing to Jesus with nothing but their sins. In September 1524, the famous scholar Desiderius Erasmus wrote his first critique of Protestantism. He called it the freedom of the will. Martin Luther quickly responded with a book titled The Bondage of the Will. He thanked Erasmus for identifying the real issue between Rome and the Reformers. I give you hearty praise and commendation on this further account that you alone, in contrast with others, have attacked the real thing, that is, the essential issue. You have not wearied me with those extraneous issues about the papacy, purgatory, indulgences and such like trifles. You and you alone have seen the hinge on which all turns and aimed for the vital spot. 
Erasmus was appalled at a God who elects to save some and not all. His plea boiled down to let God be good. Luther's response boiled down to let God be God. God cannot be put in our little box. We cannot edit the Bible to suit our sinful desires. Rather, we have to accept God's revelation of himself. A telling indication of Rome's view of salvation was the case of Edgardo Mortara. It took place in the Papal States, where the Pope was not merely the head of the church, but also the king with his own army. In late 1857, a priest heard that a Catholic serving girl had secretly baptized the infant son of the Jewish family for whom she worked. Over a hundred years earlier, Pope Benedict XIV had issued a bull that Jewish children in danger of death could be baptized without their parents' permission and then taken from them to be raised as Catholics. This baptism had taken place a few years before, when the serving girl thought the boy was going to die as an unbaptized infant. The Inquisition determined that this had made him irreversibly a Catholic. Since non-Catholics were not allowed to raise Catholics, police came and took the six-year-old from his parents. Despite international protest, Pope Pius IX refused to return the boy. Nine years later, Pius wrote to Edgardo, You are very dear to me, my little son, for I acquired you for Jesus Christ at a high price. So it is. I paid dearly for your ransom. Your case set off a worldwide storm against me and the apostolic see. People lamented the harm done to your parents because you were regenerated by the grace of the holy baptism and brought up according to God's wishes. And in the meantime, no one showed any concern for me, father of all the faithful. Rome no longer takes Jewish children from their parents. Instead, Pope Francis calls Jews elder brothers in the faith. But the idea that God is bound to regenerate whomever Rome baptizes remains unchanged. The biblical gospel is not about Rome binding God to regenerate through water baptism. It is not about God helping good people save themselves through the sacraments of the church. It is not about proving our worthiness. It is about the great exchange. Jesus taking our sins upon himself so that we might receive his righteous life counted to us. The righteous suffers for the unrighteous, the worthy for the unworthy, the just for the unjust. In his crucifixion, Jesus nails our rebellious heart, our filthy past, and our poisonous life to the cross. In his resurrection, he gives us his heart, a new heart that loves him. His perfect righteousness is counted to us as our sins were counted to him. And he puts his Holy Spirit in us, not as a reward for merit, but as a free gift to undeserving sinners. This is not the easy believism Rome loves to ridicule, but a new birth that produces good works. Rome denies the necessity of the real new birth and tells unconverted people to be baptized and act like Christians. Easy believism denies the effect of the new birth, telling people to be baptized and to have no concern for holiness. The new birth means a heart that loves God and the indwelling of the spirit of holiness in the Christian. The good works are not the cause of our salvation, but the fruit of it. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Do you see the distinction? Works are the fruit of salvation, not its prerequisite. Salvation is all of grace but a grace that transforms. This is why there is no contradiction between Paul and James. Rome's confusion over all this explains why they cannot understand the distinctions between justification and sanctification. They argue that you're never really right with God until you have been sanctified of all your sins. Yet the Apostle Paul tells us we already have peace with God 
when we have faith in Jesus. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Rome claims this idea of sola fide, justification by faith alone, was invented by Martin Luther. But once again, they misrepresent true Catholicism. Hear what just two doctors of the church said on the matter. Indeed, this is the perfect and complete glorification of God, when one does not exult in his own righteousness, but recognizing oneself as lacking true righteousness to be justified by faith alone in Christ. They said that he who adhered to faith alone was cursed, but he Paul shows that he who adhered to faith alone is blessed. Though the church fathers were closer to the Protestant reformers than to modern Rome, they were not without error. Like church councils, they sometimes contradicted one another. Rome uses their errors to create confusion, making their members despair of being able to understand these things and simply to default to Rome. But there is a standard superior even to the church fathers, not the Pope, but the Scriptures. Our plea is to take up the Bible and read it for yourself. Sacred scriptures, though whenever it wants to teach us some things like this, give it its own interpretation and does let the listener go astray. To many Catholics, this seems to be the road to chaos, but not for those who have the Holy Spirit speaking by and with the scriptures, not against them in their hearts. As Jesus said, His sheep hear His voice. When American Catholics think on these things, they should remember the frustration they have at the Supreme Court, arguing that the Constitution is a living document that judges should interpret as self-evolving. In 1973, the court claimed to discover a constitutional right to an abortion, something found nowhere in the Constitution itself nor in any of the writings of the men who wrote it. More recently, in 2015, they discovered a right to homosexual marriage. The votes of the people, the laws of the state, and the language of the Constitution itself didn't matter. The Constitution meant what a majority of the courts said it meant. As frustrated as American Catholics are at such judicial arrogance, they fail to see that their church has done much the same thing. The church is supposed to be bound to the Word of God in the Scriptures. But like the United States Supreme Court, Rome has tried to make the Bible say what it pleased. Rome may call their positions biblical and Catholic, but they are no more based on the Bible than Roe v. Wade was based on the Constitution. Take up the Bible and read. Don't try to change it to suit what you've been told it should say, but seek to be changed by it. Pray that God will speak to you through it and run to the Jesus you find there. You will not find a Jesus who is continually offered as a sacrifice in the Mass. Rather, the final high priest who made a once-for-all sacrifice and sat down on the right hand of God. You will find that Christianity is not about merely appeasing God, but about full reconciliation to Him and adoption as His beloved child in place of a Jesus who must be approached through saints and sacraments, you will find a Jesus who readily receives the worst of sinners and saves to the uttermost all who look to him in simple faith. In place of the uncertainty of Rome, you will find the Spirit bearing witness with your spirit 
that you are a child of God. When Pope Francis equates modern Catholicism with Judaism, we should remember that though the Jews said nice things about the Messiah, they rejected him when he actually came. Rather than heeding his calls to repent, they cried for his crucifixion, insisting they had no king but Caesar. Though the veil of their temple was rent from top to bottom, they apparently repaired it and went right back to their vain worship as if nothing had happened. Within that generation, God took away their temple, their priesthood, and their sacrifices. As God sent the Babylonians hundreds of years earlier, He now sent the Romans. Despite this, and the horrors of national judgment, they continue to reject Christ. When Pope Francis commends the Jews as God's chosen people and elder brothers of Catholics in the faith, we should remember Jesus' condemnation of the Jews of his day. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? This is not the Jesus of Pope Francis or the modern Roman church. This is the Jesus who promised that before that generation passed away, God would destroy his temple yet again. Despite all their religion and all their zeal, the Apostle Paul said the wrath of God had come upon the Jews to the uttermost. Within 40 years of the crucifixion, the Romans slaughtered over a million of them and destroyed that temple in which they trusted. He made the continued religion of the Old Testament impossible. This is the Jesus that warns professing Christians that many will say to him in the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The scriptures that the Jews ignored tell you that neither your church nor your faith is Catholic. What will you do with the Jesus of the Bible? If you ignore him, if you play games, what do you really think this Jesus will do with you? We implore you, do not take our word or the word of any other man, but take up the word of God and seek these things out for yourself. Find that Jesus and flee to him, because it is your soul and the souls of your children that hang in the balance. 